come before you, and Lord, we thank you for your word. And Lord, we thank you for uh, your goodness to us. And Lord, as we come to your word, we ask that you'd give us uh, wisdom and understanding to uh, read it, to, to see uh, the hope that's in Jesus Christ for us at the end of the world. And uh, Lord, that you would help us to uh, come to your throne of grace and find the uh, mercies and the gifts that we need to do your will in this time. Lord, we pray if there are any lost in here, that you would draw them to be saved. We ask the same for those listening to the message online. Lord, we ask that you'd be with our missionaries. Give them the things that they need for their task that you've sent them to do. And Lord, we ask that you'd give them protection in that land because we know that it's hostile to the gospel of Jesus. Lord, we pray that uh, you would help us where we fail you, that you'd forgive us of our sins. And Lord, that you'd keep us safe also to the coming of Christ. And it's in his holy name we pray it all. Amen. All right. Well, if you have your Bibles, would you turn to Revelation chapter 19 with me? Revelation chapter 19. And uh, as we get started, as I've, I've somewhat been doing with Revelation, I'd just like to uh, recap what we looked at last week uh, somewhat. Uh, most of what we looked at last week had to do with the one central figure that was Mystery Babylon and what that means in the book of Revelation. Uh, we remember that she sat on the dragon, that she was given power by the dragon, uh, that all of the kings which were under the dragon's influence, even the beast and the false prophet, uh, that they all drew mankind uh, into uh, Mystery Babylon, which is that a great and wicked city that's spoken of at the end of the world. Uh, and everybody uh, uh, wondered after the woman. They had amazement after her. Uh, and they committed their uh, idolatries and their fornications with this woman. And they brought all of their good things into the city and were drawn into that city by all of the good things that were in her. And at the end, we saw that because the kings and even the dragon himself uh, were under the power, uh, under the sovereignty of the Lamb, uh, that they could not do anything uh, that, was, that, that would uh, foil his plan for the world, uh, that they, at the end, turned against the city and they destroyed the good things out of the city. They had used the city to draw in all mankind into this worship of the beast, by all of these uh, nice things that they had uh, in that city. Uh, and the whole world was deceived by them. They came in, they pledged their allegiance to the dragon and the beast, and then that city was cut off. It, it, there was, uh, it was made desolate by the working of the dragon and the beast and the kings of the earth. And so all of the world of the wicked we saw not those of the Lamb, but all of those of the world were deceived by Mystery Babylon and brought in to worship the beast and the dragon. And we left off in verse 23 of chapter 18, the light of a candle shall no more at all shine in thee, that is, in Babylon. And the voice of the bridegroom and of the bride shall be heard no more at all in thee. For thy merchants were the great men of the earth, for by thy sorceries were all nations deceived. And in her was found the blood of prophets and of the saints and of all that were slain upon the earth. So they were brought in, they were deceived, all of the world was deceived by the sorceries and the, uh, the goods of the city, and they found that they were in a trap. And in that trap, again, we see that Christ is, is working his sovereign will, that in her was found the blood of prophets and of saints and of all that were slain upon the earth. The guilt of the wicked was found in that city. And so all of the wicked were drawn into that city. They were all collected into one uh, place and one cause so that 
they could be judged by the Lamb. And not only men and women and the, uh, the, the wicked humans of the earth, but also the dragon was there and the kings were there to receive the worship of uh, all of them. And this was the will of Christ. Again, he, he has gathered them together to judgment. And so we begin to read in chapter 19, And after these things, I heard a great voice of much people in heaven saying, Alleluia, salvation and glory and honor and power unto the Lord our God. For true and righteous are his judgments. For he hath judged the great whore which did corrupt the earth with her fornication and hath avenged the blood of his servants at her hand. And again they said, Hallelujah, and her smoke rose up forever and ever. Because God is now moving to judge this wicked nation, all of the righteous praise God for it. Uh, they see that it is just. They saw all of the, uh, the murders that were done, all of the wickedness, and so they're praising God for what he's doing. In verse 4, and the four and twenty elders and the four beasts fell down and worshipped God that sat on the throne saying, Amen, Hallelujah. And a voice came out of the throne saying, Praise our God, all his servants, and ye that fear him, both small and great. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, and as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of mighty thunderings, saying, Hallelujah, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. And that's what, again, we see. The Lord God omnipotent. The Lord God able to do whatever he pleases to do. Uh, that he had sovereign control over all of these things that happened to bring the people together to judgment. And all of the people, small and great, they hear the voice of God from his throne, calling all of creation to praise him for his works. In verse 7, let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him that is, uh, and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. In contrast to the harlot, to mystery Babylon, we have the bride of Christ here. Babylon, all of the wicked of the world, which will be judged as one people, that they uh, are wicked, they are detestable, they are filthy, but the bride of Christ, which we read throughout the scripture, are his saints, his people, that they are arrayed in white. They have no spot in them. They are found guiltless at the judgment of Christ. And so uh, praise is given to God for bringing them to himself uh, and uh, that, that they, uh, they are vindicated thereby. In verse 9, And he saith unto me, Write, Blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, there, These are the true sayings of God. And I fell at his feet to worship him. And he said unto me, See thou do it not. I am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So the angel that had been showing him all of these things that had been accompanying him through these visions uh, says, blessed are they that are brought to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And uh, John uh, mistakes uh, what he's supposed to do here. He, he believes that he should bow down to this angel uh, only. And this, is a, uh, this happens, of course. Uh, John does this to emphasize that even the angel uh, that had a part in this judgment that had been drawn to, to uh, go forth and to pour of his bowl onto the world, uh, that even he wasn't worthy to receive this kind of worship. 
And so he says, I am, I am nobody. He says, I am just your fellow servant. I'm just of those that have the sayings of Jesus. And so worship God only. In verse 11, it says, and I saw heaven opened. He, he says that, that to worship Christ only, uh, to, to give him praise. And so John turns and he looks and he saw heaven opened. And behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. So heaven, again, we, we see heaven is opened. Heaven has been uh, uh, shown uh, to the earth. And what comes from heaven is Christ himself to come and judge. In verse 14, And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. A reference back to his saints, to the bride of Christ. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with, with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he hath in his, on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. He's going out to judge. He judges by the things that he says, again by the law that he has given which is as a, a sharp two-edged sword, uh, just as the scroll was written on either side. He goes out to judge by the same standard and again is repeated that he is king of kings and lord of lords. He is the recipient of all the worship that's been given to this point. And I saw an angel standing in the sun and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great God, that ye may eat the flesh of kings, and the flesh of captains, and the flesh of mighty men, and the flesh of horses, and of them that sit on them, and the flesh of all men, both free and bond, both small and great. When Christ comes to judge, he doesn't just come to judge the mighty, the exalted kings. He comes also to judge the uh, lowly person. And not only them, but the kings also. All men are subject to his judgment. In verse 19, And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast, and them that worship his image. These both were cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone. And the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, which sword proceeded out of his mouth, and all the fowls were filled with their flesh." They are uh, killed. They, are, uh, they have their, their uh, external judgment brought on them. They lose their lives and in such a way that uh, everyone is made equal. All of them are eaten of the birds in the open field. Now I'd like to note uh, Isaiah 66, 15 together. Uh, and if you, uh, when we get there, uh, you might want to uh, uh, put your finger or a uh, 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 ribbon in uh, that uh, passage in Isaiah 65 and 66, because we'll go back to this here in, uh, in a couple of minutes. But Isaiah 66 and verse 15 uh, gives us the Old Testament basis for this vision that, was, uh, that uh, John is seeing here. The scripture says, For behold, the Lord will come with fire and with his chariots like a whirlwind to render his anger with fury and his rebuke with flames of fire. For by fire and by his sword will the Lord plead with all flesh and the slain of the Lord shall be many. 
They that sanctify themselves and purify themselves in the garden behind one tree in the midst, eating swine's flesh and the abomination and the mouth, um, the mouse shall be consumed together, saith the Lord. The uh, Lord comes with his people, with his uh, armies from heaven. Uh, he destroys with not only the sword, but with the fire and with the word of his mouth. And the occasion for his judgment here is that they had worshipped the beast. They had gone behind one tree into the grove, into the high place of the beast, and they had worshipped his image and his name, and they had eaten of his abominable things, and so they are judged for their idolatry and their wickedness. And uh, so the uh, beast and the false prophet are destroyed. The remnant of the wicked are slain at this time. And in chapter 20, verse 1, I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years and cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that, he must be loosed a little season. So all of the wicked are slain. Uh, those that, uh, that hated God, that had worshipped the beast and his image. But the dragon here is not slain yet. He is bound. He's thrown into this bottomless pit. He's imprisoned so that he cannot deceive the nations anymore until his time is fulfilled. Uh, and so we have a thousand years here of peace that's given from God. In verse 4, And I saw thrones, and they that sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus, and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection, on which the second death hath no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign with him a thousand years. And so there is a thousand year reign in which there is uh, complete order. Uh, Christ and his saints reign physically on the earth, uh, and none of the dead which were slain at that time, uh, other than the martyrs, are resurrected until the thousand years are over. Now, there's uh, a little question around this time period, the millennial reign of Christ. There are several uh, different uh, interpretations that are sometimes given about what this is. Uh, there's the amillennial interpretation, which is that we are currently in the thousand-year reign of Christ, uh, that it's a spiritual reign, it's not a physical reign on the earth. Uh, there's the uh, so-called post-millennial idea that this is a time in the future where Christ's spiritual reign will be, met, will be fully uh, developed. It, it will be seen throughout the earth. All the earth will be brought by the gospel under the uh, authority of Christ. Uh, the perspective that I take is called premillennialism, that, of course, Christ physically comes he physically sets up his reign. Uh, all of the uh, saints at that time are resurrected, and they are set up to reign with him on the earth also. But this has a few problems attached to it, and I'll be the first to, to admit that. Uh, if anybody thinks that their uh, beliefs about the end time are, are completely without strains and things that need to be explained, uh, then I'm skeptical about the claims of that person. Uh, but I'll tell you uh, what the problem is and how I personally uh, resolve it. Uh, the problem is that throughout the scripture, uh, the 
resurrection of both the righteous and the wicked are talked about as happening in one day. Uh, Christ talks about this when he says that, that, that uh, he will come, that the Son of Man will come. Uh, the righteous and the wicked will be before him and he will divide them as a sheep divides uh, his sheep from, uh, as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats uh, and in that day uh, the righteous will be put to eternal life and the wicked to eternal death uh, daniel also in chapter 12 uh, talks about the resurrection as being a single day and so if we have here uh, the resurrection of the righteous happening at the beginning of the thousand years and the resurrection of the wicked happening at the end, uh, it seems that it's not quite happening in a single day, uh, that we have a thousand years between the resurrection of the righteous and the resurrection of the wicked. And this is one of the reasons why many go to these other views about the millennial reign of Christ. Uh, the way that I uh, reconcile this is in Zechariah 14 and verse 1. Zechariah 14 uh, and verse 1. The scripture says, Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, and thy spoil shall be divided in the midst of thee. For I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city shall be taken, and the houses rifled, and the women ravished, and half of the city shall go forth into captivity, and the residue of the people shall not be cut off from the city. Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle, and his feet, his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem in the east, and the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof, towards the east and toward the west, and there shall be a very great valley, and half of the mountain shall be removed toward the north, and half of it toward the south. And he shall, ye shall flee to the valley to the, of the mountains, uh, for the valley of the mountains shall reach to Azal. Yea, ye shall flee, like as ye fled from before the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. And the Lord my God shall come, and all the saints with thee. So this is what we see here, that Christ comes. Uh, he comes in his fury. All of his saints come with him. And it shall come to pass in that day that the light shall not be clear nor dark, but it shall be one day which shall be known to the Lord and not day nor night, but it shall come to pass that at even evening time it shall be light. Uh, what we uh, have here is that at that day when Christ comes, uh, that at the evening time, it will still be light. Uh, that, that the presence of Christ will make it so that that thousand years, so long as he is there, is as one day. It will not turn to night during that time because Christ will give his light to the earth. Uh, this is uh, the same as what we see later uh, in Revelation when uh, God shall be the light of his people. That as Christ is present, it will be counted as day. It will not turn to night again. And so even though there's a thousand years as far as the counting of time, there is still one day between the resurrection of the righteous and the resurrection of the wicked. And... Uh, so that's the way that I personally resolve it. There are other ways that some resolve it. Some will say that uh, because a day with the Lord is, is a thousand years and a thousand years is a day that we have a, uh, a kind of thematic uh, explanation there for why this is. Uh, and there uh, are uh, you know, several other ways that people have uh, reconciled this. But that's the way that I personally do here. But let's look in verse 7 of Revelation 20 now. And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. 
Gog and Magog is t talked about in Ezekiel 39, uh, 38 and 39. Uh, these are spiritual kingdoms which uh, are brought forth. They are demonic entities uh, and may or may not be associated with uh, physical kingdoms. And they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about and the beloved city, and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. They come up to the holy city, to the city of Christ, to Jerusalem, against the saints. Uh, however this rebellion happens, uh, is mysterious to us, but we know why it happens. We know that uh, that God is allowing this to happen uh, so that he can show uh, for one final time his wrath and fury against sin and his justice. Uh, every person, every entity that comes to this battle has seen the reign of Christ for a thousand years on the earth and they have still rejected it. They have still hated him, even though he is such a good ruler. And so, uh, at the end of Gog and Magog here, uh, is told to us in Ezekiel 39 and verse 11, uh, which I'll turn to briefly here. Ezekiel 39 and verse 11 where the scripture says that it shall come to pass in that day that I will give unto Gog a place there of graves in Israel, the valley of the passengers on the east of the sea, and it shall stop the noses of the passengers. And there shall they bury Gog and all his multitude, and they shall call it the valley of Haman Gog. And seven months shall the house of Israel be burying of them, that they may cleanse the land. Yea, all the people of the land shall bury them, and it shall be to them a renown, the day that I shall be glorified, saith the Lord God. So the end of Gog and Magog, the armies of Satan, is that they are to be killed and buried. Uh, this is... Uh, of course, a spiritual burial, the, the, the valley of the passengers. Uh, it was, a, a, it was a, a, a way of talking about a spiritual destruction in that day, that they would be put out into eternal, uh, they would be put out of the eyes of uh, the people. And in verse 11, uh, we see what happens uh, in uh, Revelation 9, uh, 20, verse 11. And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. And there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books, according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell gave up the dead which were in them, and they were judged, every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. After all of this has happened, then comes the, uh, the separating out of all of the universe the uh, all men and women all spirits and angels are brought before the judgment seat of christ and he deals with them justly to the wicked according to what they have done that they have not trusted on christ that they have not been in his number and all of the evil that they have done but the righteous that they are written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. 
And so death and hell is cast into the lake of fire and all those that are still found in it uh, and the dragon himself is finally cast in. Uh, there will be no more enemy of the people of God. And this brings us to the final vision of Revelation, the vision of the new heavens and the new earth. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, and the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, come down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them, and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow, nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. Just in that, there's so much that we could go over and see what is meant. I'd like us to uh, turn back again to Isaiah 65 and 66 together. And uh, again, see the, uh, the Old Testament uh, basis for this. Uh, chapter 65 and verse 17 first. The scripture says, For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former shall not be remembered nor come into mind. But be ye glad and rejoice forever in that which I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem a rejoicing and her people a joy. And I will rejoice in Jerusalem and joy in my people. And the voice of weeping shall be no more heard in her, nor the voice of crying. Uh, the Lord makes a new heaven and a new earth. He makes Jerusalem a joy, and there will be no more crying in it. There will be no more sorrow in it. Now look in 66 and verse 1. Thus saith the Lord, The heaven is my throne, and the earth is my footstool. Where is the house that ye build unto me? And where is the place of my rest? For all those things hath mine hand made, and all those things have been, saith the Lord. But to this man will I look, even to him that is poor and of a contrite spirit, and trembleth at my word. This reference to rest here is that the world is God's temple. That God has made heaven and earth to be the place where he rests and reigns in. That when God makes the new heaven and the new earth, that this will be accomplished finally and forever. And back in Revelation, uh, keeping your thumb in Isaiah still, uh, in 21 and verse 5, He that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. That expression that they are true and faithful means that they are a promise, that he is speaking in truth, that he is faithful to fulfill that truth, that he is promising to make all things new. In verse 6, And he said unto me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. When he says it is done, uh, I just mentioned that he's referencing the Old Testament again, where it says that he declares the end from the beginning, that he is Alpha and Omega. And he's saying what he will do, that he will give to him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. 
And there came unto me one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials, full of the seven last plagues, and talked with me, saying, Come hither, I will show thee the bride, the lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain, and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God, and her light was like unto a stone most precious, even like a jasper stone, clear as crystal, and had a wall great and high, and had twelve gates, and at the gates twelve angels, and names written thereon, which are the names of the twelve tribes of the children of Israel. On the east gate three, and uh, on the north three gates, and on the south three gates, and on the west three gates. And the wall of the city had twelve foundations, and in them the names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. The uh, city which comes down uh, is built, as we see in Ephesians chapter 2, on the foundation of the apostles and, and Jesus Christ being, of course, the uh, chief cornerstone of it. He's the framer of it. In verse 15, And he that talked with me had a golden reed to measure the city and the gates thereof and the wall thereof. And the city lieth four square, and the length is as large as the breadth. And he measured the city with the reed, 12,000 furlongs. The length and the breadth and the height of it are equal. And he measured the wall thereof, and 140 and four cubits, according to the measure of a man, that is, of the angel. Uh, and the building of the wall of it was of jasper, and the city was pure gold unto clear gr uh, glass. And the foundation of the wall of the city were garnished with all manner of precious stones, the first foundation was jasper, and the second sardis, the third uh, uh, chalcedony, uh, uh, the fourth an emerald, the fifth a sardonyx, uh, the sixth sardis, the seventh uh, chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth uh, chrysoprasus, uh, uh, the eighth of jacinth, uh, the twelfth and amethyst and the 12 gates were 12 pearls every pearl uh, every several gate was of one pearl and the street of the city was pure gold as it were transparent glass so he's talking about the glory of that city that the, it is a perfect city he's saying here uh, that is made of all manner of good and perfect things that are given from god and one uh, interesting thing to note is back in verse 16, it says that the city lieth four square, uh, that all of its dimensions are of one, that it's a perfect cube that's given. Uh, and this is the same uh, proportions we will note in the Old Testament uh, as the holiest place, the place where the Ark of the Covenant was kept. Uh, it's a, a, an, an image of the the. Uh, the sacred place where God would dwell and meet with his people. And here he is living with his people. Uh, he is making good on his promise that he will be with them and be his God and they will be his people. And in verse 22, And I saw no temple therein, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. Speaking of their omnipresence, that they are all throughout that place that their their presence fills it up there's no specific place that we will have to go to worship god at he will be present with us everywhere and the city had no need of the sun neither of the moon to shine on it for the glory of god did lighten it and the lamb is the light thereof and the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it and the kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor into it. They uh, are made kings. They bring their honor to that place. And the gates of it shall not be shut at all by day. For there shall be no night there. And they shall bring the glory and honor of the nations into it. 
and there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth, neither whatsoever doth abomin worketh abomination, or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. The wicked have no part in this place at all. They are without. They are in uh, the place of suffering as they were sent. In chapter 22 then, And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. And in the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river, was there the tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruits, and yielded her fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. And they shall see his face, and his name shall be in their foreheads, and there shall no be no night there, and they need no candle, neither light of the sun. For the Lord God giveth them light, and they shall reign for ever and ever. This is the fulfillment of the promise of the new Eden, as we see the garden of God, the pure river of the water of life, as the water that flowed through Eden in that time and was promised to the prophets. The tree of life is there to be for the healing of the nations. And most of all, there shall be no more curse there. Uh, there will be no more separation from God. God had put the curse on uh, all of the world for the sake of Adam and uh, Eve and their sin. But now there will be no more curse there at all. Uh, and his servants will serve him there just as they were meant to in the beginning in the Garden of Eden. And so in verse 5, Christ says, And he said unto me, These sayings are faithful and true. And the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel to show unto his servants the things which must shortly be done. Behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of the prophecy of this book. So Jesus says out of heaven, he says that he has sent his uh, uh, messenger to the prophets. He sent his angel to uh, John. Uh, and so John uh, here takes this uh, in the wrong way again, just as he did before. Uh, he thought that this meant he ought to worship the angel which spoke with him and showed him these things. And so in verse 8, I, John, saw these things and heard them. And when I heard, had heard and seen, I fell to worship before the feet of the angel which showed me these things. Then saith he unto me, See thou do it not, for I am thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren the prophets, and of them which keep the sayings of this book, worship thou God. So he, he misunderstands again. He bows to uh, the angel which Jesus had just mentioned, uh, and the angel says, Don't worship me, worship God. And in verse 10, Christ speaks again, and he saith unto me, Seal not the sayings of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he that is wicked, uh, filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. Let all things be as they are. And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me. To give every man according to his work shall be. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life, and may enter in through the gates into the city. For without are dogs and sorcerers and whoremongers and murderers and idolaters, and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. He admonishes us. Because he comes quickly, because he has authority to judge, that we should do his commandments, that we should keep his sayings that he's given to us, that we should trust and have our confidence in him. For without the city are dogs, they're sorcerers, all those wicked uh, that the Lord judges. And I'll just read Isaiah 66, 24 quickly. Uh, 
And they shall go forth and look upon the carcasses of the men that have transgressed against me. For their worm shall not die, neither shall their fire be quenched. And they shall be an abhorring unto all flesh. Without our dogs and sorcerers, all of those who repudiated Christ. They are without the city. They have no part in those good things. So in verse 16, I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright and morning star. The spirit and the spirit and the bride say, come. And let him that heareth say, come. And let him that is a thirst come. And whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. Uh, the command of Jesus to us at the end of this book, the command of the Spirit and of all of the saints of God to anyone who hears these words is to come and to declare that all who will should come to this place, to the marriage supper of the Lamb, to the new Eden, to the paradise of God, and take of the water of life freely. For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book, if any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. And he which testifieth these things saith, Surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so come, Lord Jesus. Uh, the final word of Jesus is that we should keep the sayings of this book. We shouldn't diminish from them. We shouldn't omit anything from them. Uh, we shouldn't add to them, uh, but that we should cherish them and follow what it says to us. I believe this is not only speaking about the book of Revelation, but to the whole book of prophecy, the entirety of Scripture that's given to us. Christ sets his seal on the Scriptures at this point, and none ought to add or subtract anything from it. And so we say with John and with Christ, surely he comes quickly. Amen. Even so, come Lord Jesus. We should look forward to his coming. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. And uh, as we close, I don't think that there's any better way that the book could end. Uh, we've gone all throughout uh, the scripture together. Uh, we haven't read uh, every single word uh, in this study that we've been going through. Uh, but I hope we see what, uh, has, uh, what the Lord has intended in it. Uh, and that is that the grace of Jesus Christ would be with us, uh, that he would dwell among us, he would be our God, we would be his people, that we would be reconciled to him even in spite of our sin, uh, and that we would have a blessed fellowship in heaven with him. And so to end our study, uh, I would just like to uh, remind everyone of the gospel of Jesus, uh, that the Spirit and the Bride says to all of us here, Come, take of the water of life freely. Jesus said to the woman uh, of Samaria uh, that if you had known the gift of God and who it is that says to you, give me drink, you would have asked of him and he would have given you living water. And I would pray that you would ask of him that he would give you that living water, uh, that he would forgive your sins, that he would take his, your burden and your sin on himself and that he would give you the gift of life which he rightfully earned, and that you would see his grace and gift to you. And so I pray if there are any that are lost in here or that uh, listen to the message later, uh, that you would draw, uh, come to Jesus Christ, uh, that you would uh, ask of him and he would give you that living water. And uh, so with that, I think that's a good place to stop. And let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we thank you for uh, the sure prophecy that you give us in this book. Lord, we pray that you would help us to always cling to it, uh, always to defend it from those that uh, would come against it. Uh, and Lord, do so in a way that's consistent with what it says. Uh, we ask that you would help us to take the same message that we see uh, is given to us at the end of the book, uh, to call all men to Christ, to come and drink of the water of life, which uh, flows from his 
good graces. And Lord, we pray that you'd help us to do that in a faithful way. Lord, we pray if there are any lost in here that you would be drawing them and they would be saved. We ask that you would uh, be with those that listen to this uh, later, uh, Lord, and on the internet, uh, that they would look past my infirmity, and Lord, that they would see Jesus Christ as their perfect Savior. Uh, Lord, we pray that uh, you would be with our missionaries to help them to see Christ uh, coming in glory to uh, restore them to uh, the place that he's given to them, uh, a place of authority and power, and Lord, of comfort in him. Uh, Lord, we pray that you would be with our leaders, uh, help them to see that they ought to serve Jesus Lord, that they ought not to serve their own, that they uh, should flee from Babylon, which is to be destroyed, and that they would cling to Jesus Christ and they would be saved. Lord, we ask that you would be with each of us as we leave this place to protect us and uh, bring us to the end where Christ will vindicate us. And Lord, we ask that where we sin against you, that you'd forgive us and that you'd help us to serve him better. And it's in his holy name we pray it all. Amen.